Well, good afternoon, everyone. Emily Rosen, thank you for having us in your beautiful constituency. It's always great to be in the constituency of Banff, Kananaskis. Uh, I want to thank all of you online for tuning in for what will be an exciting announcement that will benefit Albertans who love K-Country and the beautiful Bow Valley of Alberta. Alberta's government stands with all Albertans who want to ensure Kananaskis and other special places in this province are protected for generations to come. From hiking and biking to camping, skiing and golfing, Kananaskis hosts endless opportunities to enjoy the great outdoors. It is also quite simply one of the most beautiful and unique places on the planet. With amenities and experiences that rival neighbourhood mountain parks, it's no wonder Kananaskis has become one of North America's premier mountain tourist destinations. Frankly, the numbers don't lie. Since 2014, the Kananaskis visitation has increased by nearly 70%. There were almost 5.4 million visits to Cape Country last year alone. That's 1 million more visits than Banff National Park. In a non-pandemic year, four out of five visitors to Cape Country are from right here in Alberta. Albertans know and appreciate a good thing when they discover it. We expect the trend of record high visitations to continue post-COVID. This is not a one-off for Cape Country. And it's great to see so many folks venturing out to explore their own backyard. As I've said before, there is no greater example of our beautiful backyard than Kananaskis, one of Alberta's true crown jewels. However, Albertans agree there needs to be a balance between recreation opportunities and conservation. More visitors to Cape Country is great news. However, it has increased pressures on the land in a very big way. These pressures have been well documented. You've seen the photos and you've heard the stories. Unfortunately, Cape Country has seen significantly more litter illegal parking, overcrowded day use areas and trails, human and wild, human wildlife conflicts, injuries and several other major issues in the past few years. This has put an increased strain on our facilities and on our services and our, our resources that are needed to maintain Cape Country. The Kananaskis public safety team whose search and rescue operations are dispatched from this beautiful new facility that we're at today responded to 428 calls for help in 2020. That's a 51% increase in one year alone. It's more incidents than in national parks, in the national parks of Banff, Yoho, Kootenai, Jasper, and Waterton combined in 2020. The cost to the provincial government of providing recreation, conservation, and public safety services in Kananaskis over the past five years is about $107 million. Quite simply, these pressures are not sustainable. We're fast approaching another extremely busy summer recreation season. Action is needed now to make sure we can keep Kananaskis beautiful and safe now and into the future. That's what today's announcement is all about. With that in mind, today I'm pleased to announce that the government is planning 11.5 million for new and approved services, amenities and infrastructure in the Cape Country region. This additional, additional provincial funding will go towards facilities, trails and day use areas. I'll have more details to share about those new projects and others that will benefit Kananaskis in the weeks ahead. But one significant project that I know people will be interested to hear about that is included within this new investment will be $1 million to begin planning uh, to work on the upgrades to the Camor Nordic Centre with the intent of making future capital investments in future years to this world-class sporting facility. These 11.5 million in new investments will build on the 160 million in capital improvements in Kananaskis made by the province uh, since 2013. Investments that have already improved visitor experience, access and safety. Those include upgrades to campgrounds, renovations to the William Watson Lodge and construction of the new $20 million Kananaskis Emergency Service Centre that you see behind me. This state-of-the-art centre replaces the previous centre which was built in 1985. The old building was no longer functionally adequate. It did not meet updated national fire safety standards. The new centre, though, is home to fire and rescue services for the Kananaskis Improvement District. It also supports prevention, inspection, educational programs and training. As I mentioned, Kananaskis Emergency Service Centre also houses the Alberta Parks Dispatch Program for search and rescue operations. These are the kind of investments that we will continue to make in Cape Country. These new investments, along with the ongoing operation dollars for the Cape Country, will be supported in part by a new Kananaskis Conservation Pass. 
The pass is for vehicles entering into the park to enjoy Kananaskis and provincial sites in the Bow Valley beginning on June 1st. It will apply to parks and public lands within those areas. The revenue for each pass will go directly back towards enhancing conservation activities, services and facilities right here in Kananaskis. The cost is modest and is in fact less than the access fee that is charged in the National Mountain Parks in our province like Banff and Jasper. The conservation pass is only $15 per day or $90 per year per vehicle. As a per vehicle fee, the conservation pass will help with traffic management. It will encourage folks to find alternative means of transportation to Kananaskis when appropriate. It will strengthen public safety by funding boots on the ground with new conservation officers to provide education and enforcement and to assist with search and rescue activities. The new pass will also support the reopening of visitor centres and the continued grooming of cross-country ski trails here in Kananaskis. We are investing 100% of the revenue earned for the pass back into Kananaskis. This conservation pass is about managing demand and supporting environmental sustainability. Funds from the pass will also facilitate the expansion of the protected area in Bow Valley Provincial Park. Today's announcement is about securing Cape Country's bright future. It also addresses the feedback from Albertans who told us how much they value their wild outdoor spaces. This past November to January, we asked Albertans for their ideas to help shape the future of sustainable recreation on Crown land in our province. Two thirds were supportive of fees to help maintain and protect Crown land use for recreation. Albertans said clearly to us, investment is needed to maintain the experiences that they love as well as to enforce the rules and to protect the environment. That's exactly what this conservation pass will accomplish. It will direct support to the critical work that government, nonprofit groups, communities and local businesses do together to ensure parks and public lands are conserved for future generations. Today's announcement and the new Cape Country Conservation Pass is supported by a variety of key stakeholders, including the Alberta Conservation Association, Friends of Kananaskis Country, the Recreational Vehicle Dealer Association, Alberta Off-Highway Vehicle Association, William Watson Lodge, the MD of Bighorn, and the Kananaskis Improvement District Council, who you will hear from shortly today. But first, I am pleased to be joined today by my friend, the MLA for Banff Kananaskis, Miranda Rosen, who I will now invite to the podium to say a few words. Okay, well, thank you so much, Minister Nixon, for being out here today back in Kananaskis country and for this great announcement. I'm Miranda Rosen, the lucky MLA for beautiful Banff Kananaskis. There are many locations in our world that have built thriving tourism economies for themselves out of man-made attractions. But tourism has always come naturally to what is literally our neck of the woods, uh, thanks to the God-given beauty that surrounds us. We are so fortunate to live and recreate in this incredible place and the ability to get outside and enjoy the great outdoors has served as a beacon of hope for many throughout the COVID-19 pandemic over the past year. But the increased use of these lands is straining them. Last year, our beloved Kananaskis country welcomed over 5 million visitors. That's 1 million visitors more than Banff National Park, which is one of, if not possibly the most busiest national park in the entire country. While it is so great to see people enjoying and appreciating our Rocky Mountains like never before, this increased visitation, as experienced by literally anyone who tried to come out here for a day hike last summer, has led to traffic jams, illegal parking, strain on infrastructure capacities, and more emergency calls than Banff, Jasper, Waterton, Yoho, and Kootenai National Parks combined. Our residents, local businesses, conservation officers, and search and rescue teams have seen this firsthand. I've had conversations with many of them over the past year about the sustainability of this beloved park. Today's introduction of the Kananaskis Conservation Pass is welcome news. 
100% of the proceeds of this conservation pass will be directly invested into the region. To hire new armed conservation officers for the area, reopen our visitor information centers because we all know how difficult it is to, find a, to try and find your trailhead without cell service, expanding the protected landmass of Kananaskis region, and investing millions into other critical infrastructure for the region. It's good news for local municipalities, businesses, and recreation groups alike. The Kenanaskis Improvement District, the MD of Bighorn, the Alberta Conservation Association, and the Friends of Kenanaskis Country, just to name a few, are excited about the introduction of today's pass. We must all do our part to make sure that this special place stays special. The introduction of this conservation pass is on top of additional conservation work Minister Nixon has done to, over the past couple of years to conserve 55,000 acres of environmentally sensitive land across the province, form 170 co-management partnerships for environmental stewardship with charities and not-for-profits, increase the size of provincial park in northeast Alberta to create the largest continual protected area of boreal forest in the entire world, and grow the recycling industry in Alberta. Our government knows that the Rocky Mountains in our backyard have always made this province a uniquely attractive destination for both business and tourism investment. And that, and that if we wish to grow and diversify Alberta's economy, we must preserve this beauty all around us. Balancing economic growth with environmental protection, protection and sustainability is paramount. I also want to take this opportunity to highlight just how enthusiastic I am for today's announcement that our government will be investing up to $1 million into the design work and planning for the Kenmore Nordic Centre upgrade. I first approached Minister Nixon and his department about this project in 2019 and have lobbied quite literally anyone who would lend me in any year since then. I would be remiss if I didn't thank Norbert Meyer on behalf of the Alberta World Cup Society and Ken Davies on behalf of the Alberta Event Hosting Society for Biathlon for their tireless advocacy for this project over the past two years. The Kenmore Nordic Centre is a pillar of our Boat Valley community. It is a world-class training facility so have helped Canmore become home to more Olympians per capita than anywhere else in the in the country, and that is a statistic we are proud of. A complete upgrade to the Canmore Nordic Centre would allow our town and province to once again satisfy the criteria for the Biathlon World Cups and host these major events right here in Alberta. The, these, the kinds of events made possible through a renovated Nordic Centre will certainly bring tremendous economic impact to our communities. In fact, in 2019, the, our government invested just $2 million into several large-scale winter Nordic events in Alberta and realized a net return of $22 million on our investment, seen through visitor spending, hotel stays, restaurant visits, and international publicity. That's a pretty good return. I'm so grateful that Minister Nixon and his department have recognized this upgrade as a priority for our government and that, as of today, we've officially started the path to making this upgrade a reality through the $1 million of funding towards the design work. Whether you're an environmentalist, a camper, a hiker, a golfer, a kayaker, or just a general outdoor enthusiast, or maybe even a future Olympian in training, today's announcement to expand and protect our beautiful Kananaskis country while funding design work for the complete Nordic Centre upgrade is amazing news. So thank you to Minister Nixon for all of his work to make this announcement a reality, to the many stakeholders and businesses within Kananaskis who have provided insight and advice to us politicians, and of course to all the Albertans who have made this little slice of paradise their second home. Today is a good day for all and an even better day for the future of our environment. So thank you for your time. And now we'd like to call up Melanie Nip, who is the chair of the Kananaskis Improvement District, for further comment. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, Minister Nixon, for inviting me to join you on this announcement today. Uh, as said, I am Melanie Ganip, and I am the chair of Kananaskis Improvement District Council, which is the local government here in Kananaskis. As I was driving up here today from Calgary, uh, there's a section of Highway 40, just kind of at the southern end of Barrier Lake, and you come up the hill, and then you are faced suddenly with this spectacular view of the Kananaskis Valley. And every time I come through that gap, I think, wow, is this place ever incredibly beautiful? And I also think, wow, am I ever incredibly fortunate to have this in my own backyard. I grew up in Saskatchewan, and while we have arguably fewer mountain vistas out there, um, my family were avid users of the provincial park system. 
And it was commonplace then, as it is now, for people to pay for access to provincial parks. So I think in some ways that we as Albertans, we've been very, very fortunate to have this at our disposal for so long, for so little direct cost. But as a local government, we know that public services cost money. And we also know that user pay is a tried and true way of um, attributing those costs to those who benefit most from them. Examples of those costs would be for the services which are um, housed in this fantastic building behind us. Public um, safety and protection, um, protective services, fire. And we believe that it's very important for the government to be able to continue to provide those services to our local residents, our local businesses, and to the millions of Albertans that we host every year. And so, Kananaskis Improvement District Council supports this, the, recreation, or the conservation pass, as a sustainable means of being able to continue to provide and hopefully enhance the services and facilities that we all enjoy here in Kananaskis, as well as to protect the environment around us, because truly that is what's, what makes Kananaskis such a special place. Thank you. Please. Hi there, this is a question for Minister Nixon. Uh, why did you decide to connect these passes with vehicles rather than household addresses like the Parks Canada passes? Well, there's two reasons for that. One is, quite frankly, this will be uh, cheaper than the national park system, which we are trying to make uh, it relatively affordable to be able to enjoy Kananaskis while still meeting our sustainability objectives. Uh, second is uh, one of the uh, secondary goals of the conservation pass uh, will be to slow down some of the vehicle traffic, not the people coming to the park, but to encourage as much as possible uh, more people uh, coming in the same vehicle. Uh, the reality is, and you don't have to have spent too much time here in the summer, we're running out of spots to be able to uh, park vehicles. Uh, and it is having a significant impact on the environment up here in Kananaskis uh, where people are parking because of those overflow situations, uh, both on wildlife as well as on vegetation within Kananaskis. And then most importantly, in some ways right now, it's causing significant safety issues for those people that are visiting Kananaskis right now. So over time, we are, we are hoping by going by vehicle, we'll see the average uh, number of people in each vehicle uh, increase uh, and be able to uh, enter the uh, park for more, uh, you know, for less by coming together in one vehicle. My understanding from the Provincial Parks Department is that we average about 2.6 people per vehicle right now, uh, and we'd like to see that uh, increase a little bit uh, as we're going forward. Follow-up question, Kevin? Yeah, I, I guess I have two. Uh, the first is you're encouraging people to ride together or to carpool, but we're in a pandemic, right? So I'm confused about why you're encouraging that. And then the second one is you said this is going to be cheaper, or you tried to make it cheaper than the National Parks Pass, but I'm looking at the fun, the rates for that right now, and uh, for up to seven people in a vehicle, a family pass, I pay 140 and I can get into 80 parks across the country. How is yours $90 for one park cheaper? Well, again, it is that ninety dollars is considerably cheaper uh, than one hundred and forty dollars. Uh, the reality is, we are only charging a fee inside one of our parks uh, that is like that. Whereas you see, the National Park Services has several major parks the size of Kananaskis inside the province, so that they can make that spread across multiple parks. Uh, we're not in a situation where we would need to do that currently in the province. You're right; we are in a pandemic. Having said that, we are going to come to the end of this pandemic uh, sooner than later, hopefully, and be able to move this province forward. And we have a responsibility to be able to make sure that Kananaskis has a future. Uh, too many uh, previous governments.
governments have not dealt uh, with the sustainability situation when it comes to Kananaskis and to the overall uh, sustainable situation of our provincial park system, quite frankly, and the consequences of that decision not to take action to be able to create a way that we can protect the environment while still being able to make sure that we can uh, provide the services that people need when they come to places like Kananaskis. Uh, that lack of action in the past has created the situations that we've seen. And we've all seen the pictures. We've seen the piling up of garbage, uh, the abuse of sewage and washrooms, uh, the parking in inappropriate places causing safety hazards, the fact that the emergency ser services inside uh, this area has had to increase their calls by 51 percent. It has more search and rescue calls than every mountain national park combined is, a, is from the lack of action from previous governments to be able to create a sustainable situation to protect the environment, provide adequate staffing and enforcement, and provide adequate capital and services inside uh, Kananaskis. And this will be able to make sure that we overcome that. Operator, can you put through the next caller, please? Audrey Nouveau, Radio Canada. Hi, Minister. Thank you for taking my question. My question is for you. Um, I understand that there are issues with too many cars in the park. However, it's not easy for people to get to Kananaskis without a car if they're not local residents. Um, I don't see a family with little ones in tow biking from Calgary, for example. So what's your plan to help people get into the park without a vehicle and not just carpooling, other means? Well, again, we are at the start of this process, but when it comes to vehicles, also be able to create revenue sources, to be able to increase parking locations, to help those who are coming by cars to park safer, and to be able to increase services. Other parks of this magnitude across North America have achieved incredible results by using different type of busing technology within the park, increasing parking lots, and being able to invest in being able to overcome that the 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 excessive traffic that is coming into an area that can't sustain it. This goal is not to immediately overcome that, but to be able to start to build a foundation, to be able to make sure that Kananaskis is sustainable, and these type of infrastructure decisions and services can be made in the future to, again, make sure people can access the park safely while being able to meet the environmental protective objectives of the Parks Department uh, and making sure that this beautiful place of Kananaskis will be available for future generations to come and recreate in. Follow-up question, Audrey? Yes. You say right now this path is only for Kananaskis because it has particular and intense issues, but do you already open the door to uh, putting a path like that in place for other provincial parks, or is that off the table? Well, in Alberta, our provincial park system is a little different than some of the other provinces. Most provinces have brought in day-use fees, but the reality is in Alberta, of the vast majority of our 400 and some parks are, quite frankly, campgrounds, which are already charging fees for people to be able to utilize. Kananaskis is in a unique situation. There may be only a handful of other parks uh, that, don't, that aren't really just falling within that campground uh, type of category, but they don't see the same level of use the same level of conservation value, and the same level of services. So in the case of Kananaskis, we have the highest level of services anywhere in the provincial park system, the highest level of use anywhere in the provincial uh, park system, uh, and that requires a unique uh, situation to be able to make sure that we can conserve it. If other parks end up in similar situations in the future, I'm sure governments will look uh, to this alternative, particularly because two-thirds of Albertans have been clear that they prefer to pay a modest fee to be able to make sure that they can protect these landscapes and receive the services that they need while they're in those areas. But the reality is there is no other provincial park that is currently in the situation that Kananaskis is in. Operator, can you put through the next caller, please? Lucy Edwardson, CBC. Hi, Minister. Thank you for taking my question. Um, you, you have mentioned a number of times this $5 million number for um, visitors to the park. How are you collecting that data, um, and how will we continue to collect uh, visitor data to know how many users we are getting? So we collect that data primarily through traffic counts. Uh, I do have the Assistant Deputy Minister of Parks here, though, so he may want to come up and elaborate in a second on exactly how we get that data, but it's done through uh, that process. Um, and, in fact, actually, I'll bring Shane Schreider up, who's the Assistant Deputy Minister of Parks, and he can talk about both how we have the data now and how we're going to get the data uh, in the future.
Uh, thanks, Minister. Uh, so uh, through the last uh, couple of years, we've had uh, traffic counters at uh, all of the entrance and exits to the uh, to the uh, Kananaskis area. And so we've recorded in excess this year of 2 million cars uh, or vehicles accessing the uh, park and park facilities. Uh, there is a kind of generally accepted uh, multiplier or factor that uh, is in use with most park and recreation uh, organizations that they, on average, there's 2.6 people per vehicle. So that gets us to uh, the rough number of uh, 5.4 million uh, visitors. Uh, we're in the future, we're going to continue with that traffic counting, and we're also going to have additional um, uh, additional staff on the ground to try and gauge the actual number of individuals using some of the real high-use areas so we can get much more uh, uh, concrete data, especially around some of the specific high use areas like grassy lakes. Um, so that's how we uh, arrived at the number. Um, can I follow up on that? Yeah, follow up question. Yes. Um, okay, so um, two things. Uh, one, um, I understand that there are certain areas that are going to be exempt from this, including McLean Creek, um, but that there may be another fee being considered for areas like that, and, uh, such as a motorized vehicle fee. Uh, can you elaborate on that and what that might look like and how much that might be and when we might know more about that? And in terms of um, comparing the number that you were just talking about to Banff, um, saying that Banff only had $4 million last year, um, if we're counting vehicle traffic the way that you just explained, are we excluding through traffic same-day re-entries and entries outside of business hours, as one of my colleagues pointed out online, that Banff does when they collect that data? How is it comparable if we don't do the same? Um, Shane, I'll just check if you want to follow up on the comparable as far as the through traffic. Yeah, when you're done, Minister. But uh, on t and I, I missed the question as I was coming up, so I'll get you to repeat it. So it's uh, you are correct. This is, but the price of it is no secret. It was written inside the conservation plan of the United Conservative Party uh, during the last election uh, that we committed to bringing forward a uh, modest ATV fee uh, and random camping fee on, in areas of the province where camping does not take place within campgrounds, but random on Crown land. Uh, there are some areas around Kananaskis, particularly McLean Creek, that would fall into that. We don't want to see fee stacking. That's not the intention of this at all. And so McLean Creek would be exempt from the Kananaskis Conservation Pass and instead would go uh, into the process that's been created around the random camping and the ATV uh, fees going forward. Uh, again, this was an alternative to the previous government's plan for areas like McLean Creek or uh, portions of the eastern slopes that are outside of the provincial park system uh, where they were moving forward with large scale closures to restrict access for random camping and different types of activities. We put forward a plan instead uh, with working with uh, stakeholder groups that represent uh, people that use those landscapes uh, to be able to bring in, again, a modest fee that went to dedicated revenue uh, to make sure that it was invested back into nonprofit organizations on Crown land who work with us to maintain trail infrastructure, uh, particularly helping us with water crossing issues and other environmental issues, as well as to increase boots on the ground. And uh, In this year's Alberta Environment Budget, you see 50 new FDEs to go for frontline work, including 20 new conservation officers. This is something that we heard loud and clear from Albertans about before the last election over the last two years was the need for more conservation officers out inside our wild places. Uh, and so that will help fund that and be able to move that forward. And then lastly, to help with things like search and rescue and municipal needs in areas outside of Kananaskis, inside the Eastern Slope, uh, where you have volunteer search and rescue crews providing most of the services for uh, individuals out in those areas, as well as municipalities through the fire departments and other resources helping uh, the province manage that, those large scale landscapes. Uh, two communities that I represent, Rocky Mountain House and Sundry, sometimes have over 100,000 people camping west of them on a long weekend. And I can tell you my hometown has about 3,000 people, so when there's 100,000 people camping outside of it, uh, that's a significant burden to those municipalities. So this will create uh, some ways for us to be able to partner and help get them um, some adequate resources to be able to help manage those situations. Operator, can you put through the next caller, please? Catherine Gregowski, operator today. Thanks for taking my question. I'll, I'll ask both right out the gate. Uh, so the first question will be to Minister Nixon. 
Um, in terms of metrics, how many vehicles are you hoping to reduce by this um, $90 vehicle fee? And my second question would be for MLA Rosen. Um, you, you represent the area of Banff, which is the has the second highest uh, COVID case counts in the province. You've been very vocal about um, wanting ease restrictions, but I'm, I'm wondering what other advocacy have you done for Banff? Have you been pushing for more vaccines? Have you been pushing for more testing? What what have you done for Banff? So. I was clear at the beginning, let me be clear again. One of the spinoffs that we're hoping will be eventually some reduced traffic count because on the trajectory that we're at, uh, it's not sustainable. But the reality is that we're taking this action today uh, because of sustainability issues within Kananaskis. We have a responsibility uh, to be able to provide uh, services to Albertans that utilize uh, this this beautiful place, uh, to be able to make sure that we can keep search and rescue operations and emergency services fully funded, to be able to make sure that we can provide adequate services like campgrounds and day use zones and parking lots. But most importantly, we have a responsibility to conserve this landscape, one of the most beautiful places in the world. And quite frankly, the situation that we find ourselves in is not sustainable no more, which is why we're moving forward with a conservation pass to be able to make sure that we can create adequate funding and a sustainable situation for the park long term. If we're able to see some reduced traffic counts long term, that's why we chose to go by vehicle instead of person. Another reason why we chose to go by vehicle instead of person is we don't want to invest large money inside infrastructure like kiosks and other things at the entrance of the park. Instead, we would prefer to use technology around license plates, uh, which will make it more affordable for the taxpayer and for Albertans utilizing Kananaskis. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Emily Rosen. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, you are correct that the town of Banff is experiencing rapid case growth right now with regards to COVID-19. Um, and in, uh, a lot of this is attributed currently, we believe, to the fact that Banff is nearly solely reliant on tourism and visitation. So not only are workers in Banff uh, prone to high contact with the virus, especially as we approach the summer season, but it's estimated by hospitality workers and hospitality industry that nearly 80% of Banff's hospitality workers live in communal living right now. Uh, so once one person catches the virus, it's very quick and very rapid spread. So I've been working quite closely with the mayor of Banff. In fact, I think we talked on the phone pretty much every day, if not twice a day last week, uh, as well as key business stakeholders in the community and the Minister of Health's office to advocate for vaccines for Banff. I am happy to report that we opened a vaccination clinic at the Fenlands Recreation Center uh, last week. Uh, I believe we gave that center 240 doses of vaccine, all of which booked up in about one hour, uh, very high demand. And I believe the next shipment of vaccines will be arriving on May 4th, uh, so sometime next week. So I uh, absolutely understand the need for continued vaccination in the town site and the Port National Park of Banff. Unfortunately, we are waiting on continued shipments from the federal government. As we are all aware, vaccine procurement is sole sourced by the federal government and until we continue to get more shipments and more doses from them. We have limited capacity to administer, but once those vaccines and those doses keep arriving in Alberta, I'll continue to advocate alongside the mayor and business stakeholders and the Minister of Health's office to make sure that we get some of those doses out to the Bow Valley. Operator, can you put to the next caller, please? The next question comes from Olivia Condon, Calgary Herald. Hi there, thanks for taking my question. This question is for Minister Nixon. Considering that conservation is in the main, can you speak a little bit more specifically about the conservation effort specifically in Kananaskis? Kind of who um, and how is the government working to ensure that some of the revenue from these fees goes towards supporting wildlife and environment uh, conservation specifically? Well, a, a couple things. First off, Alberta, uh, outside of the Provincial uh, Parks Department, invests a significant amount of money uh, both in Kananaskis and elsewhere in the province on managing and conserving wildlife. Uh, this pass uh, in no way is to overcome that obligation for the province. The province has continued to be very committed to that, particularly some of the groundbreaking work that we're doing on species at risk uh, like caribou uh, inside northern Alberta where this government's been able to advance that file further than any government in the past decade. Uh, but, uh, gr uh, grizzly bear management, which we've been able to uh, 
see see increased numbers happening all across the province and it's extremely excited uh, to see that. That work will continue within Kananaskis as it does elsewhere in the eastern slopes and anywhere within the province. But the reality is that the environmental impact of 5.4 million people coming to this highly sensitive ecosystem and landscape inside our province uh, is having environmental impacts on the landscape which in turn impacts wildlife and, and in this area of course key species like, key, uh, like the grizzly bear and this pass will allow us to be able to invest inside a uh, significant infrastructure uh, and to be able to put in the resources to be able to manage the impacts of what is taking place so again uh, updating uh, day use zones, updating parking, uh, dealing with some of those infrastructure issues, and then most importantly when it comes to wildlife, uh, a significant investment inside frontline employees uh, to help with human wildlife conflicts that we see in Kananaskis and all across the eastern slopes. Follow-up question, Olivia? Yeah, just wondering if there are any specific organizations that you're working with within the parks who have vested interest um, or the experience necessary to kind of help point you in that direction of what needs to be taken into account as a priority? Well, we're working very closely, first of all, with the Alberta Environment Parks biologists and the entire Fish and Wildlife Department of the Alberta government to do incredible work both here in Kananaskis and elsewhere inside the province. Uh, and we continue to work with uh, with key organizations and partners on the scientific side. I don't know if there's some specific uh, area of wildlife management that you're uh, interested in, but again, I want to emphasize that the primary focus of wildlife management and funding actually comes from the Fish and Wildlife Department inside uh, the Department of Environment. Uh, and instead, right now, the main focus for Alberta Environment and Parks when it comes to the conservation pass is making sure that we get the proper resources uh, to mitigate the environmental impacts of the 5.4 million visitors to the special spot. Operator, can you put through the next caller, please? John Bray, Calgary Herald. Minister, uh, just to be clear, you can put two vehicles on a $15 ticket or a $90 yearly pass every time they go into the park. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct, Don, and that, that's to make sure that a family who most often has two vehicles can use whatever vehicle they would like to uh, for that particular trip during a year. And I presume that the reason you're saying you're cheaper than the feds is because they charge per person, like for an annual pass for a couple, a pair of adults, it's like $140. A year. Is that why you're saying your system is basically a cheaper system? Well, we are cheaper than the feds. We're cheaper than the feds inside Banff National Park by person, and we're cheaper than the feds by annual pass uh, for a, a vehicle. The annual pass to go into Banff National Park is $140. It would be $90 in the case of Kananaskis. Uh, and I believe the daily pass is about $20 a person inside the Banff National Park. It would be about $15. It is $15 in Kananaskis. Follow-up question? Our question is a little mysterious because we heard earlier that uh, there was some work being done on how you did. How are you going to serve the low-income people by giving them less? Are you not going to check income tax returns, I'm sure. How the heck are you going to do that? Well, we'll be working on that process through the department. I mean, some of the things that you're going to see, Don, will be exemptions for uh, individuals on AISH. Uh, we'll be following our, our national park uh, partners and the federal government and some of the steps that they've taken within the National Park Service uh, to make sure that the national parks can still be accessible to lower income uh, Albertans and in their case Canadians. Uh, it will, you know, free park days, different type of uh, partnerships with organizations uh, to be able to get people to the park that may not be able to otherwise utilize it. Uh, and you'll hear more about that from the department in the coming days. But our intention again will be to follow Banff National Park who's been able to uh, operate uh, quite effectively for many decades uh, using their fee structure and making sure that people can still utilize the park. Operator, can you put through the last caller, please? Lisa Johnson, Edmonton Journal. Hi, thanks for taking my question. This is for uh, Minister Nixon. You've mentioned that this park funding system isn't sustainable and that Kananaskis is somewhat unique in, in the way that users take advantage of it. Um, this regulation change depends on the passing of Bill 64, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, um, and is its own standalone piece of leg or regulation. Um, is, is this the last fee increase that we'll hear of um, under the changes made with Bill 64, or are there more to come? 
Well, so to be clear, Bill 64 would impact public lands, uh, and there are portions of the area that are known as Kananaskis, uh, you know, I'll call it Kananaskis proper, that do have public lands within it, not provincial parks. The ability to charge a fee inside the provincial park system already exists and has nothing to do with uh, Bill 64. But Bill 64 does create the ability to bring in the random camping fee, as well as to make sure that the uh, Kananaskis Conservation Pass would uh, be brought into place on site uh, public lands within Kananaskis proper, the area that surrounds and is between the provincial parks of Kananaskis. Uh, and it would also be uh, creating a situation to fulfill the platform commitment to Albertans uh, that there would be a modest random camping fee going forward, uh, which will be completed. And then ultimately, you'll see in this fall uh, the promised Alberta Trails Act, which will protect Alberta trails and the legacy of trails all across this province uh, and respect the partnership that we have with all sorts of organizations that help us maintain our trail network all across the province and across the eastern slopes. And at the same time as that legislation is in place, the finalization of the promise ATV fee will come into place. The reason the ATV fees are not moving forward right now is because ATVs already charge registration uh, and we are trying to make very, very clear that we don't expect uh, fee stacking at all. And instead what we're trying to do is create dedicated revenue to the recreation activity that's involved uh, with the area that the fee uh, is being charged. And so we're working our way through that process with other departments in government to make sure that there's no stacking of fees. Uh, and so instead we'll bring that forward at the same time as uh, we do the promised uh, Trails Act. Follow-up question? Thanks. Yeah, so the Trails Act and, and ATVs are, are obviously involved, but I'm, I'm wondering if you can commit today to not extending this kind of fee structure that you're announcing today to other parks or to other Crown lands or to anywhere where Albertans go uh, camping in Alberta. So, uh, to be clear, there is no intention right now outside of those fees that uh, I just spoke about uh, for the Alberta government to bring in uh, any other fees. Uh, but to also be clear that uh, Alberta's government is committed to protecting uh, these places and the legacy that is associated with them. Uh, and if there are other landscapes that find themselves eventually in the same situation as Kananaskis, I certainly hope that we eventually see another large mountain park recreation area that Albertans are enjoying like this, uh, where you're seeing a high level of services needed, a high level of use, and a high level of conservation need uh, by the taxpayer to invest inside an area. Uh, I'm sure that future government will look towards this model because again two-thirds of Albertans have been clear they prefer this model uh, because they would like to see their money go back to the recreation resource that they care about and to make sure that they can protect the legacy of these uh, special places going forward but right now there's no intention outside of those fees that we discussed thank you for joining us everyone today